Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ohio EPA's next webinar in our In Your Community Local Leaders webinar series. My name is Dan Sowery with the Division of Environmental and Financial Assistance here at Ohio EPA, and I will be moderating this morning's open dumping of solid waste and scrap tires in your community presentation with Ohio EPA's Carl Musseden and Kevin Shoemaker. We also have Shannon Cohen Denson and Bruce McCoy from Ohio EPA's Division of Materials and Waste Management with us to help address regulatory questions submitted during this presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items to help you participate and engage with our presenters during this morning's session. On this slide here, you will see a screenshot of an example of an attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right hand corner. For this webinar, you are listening in using your computer uh, audio. If you're having any sound issues, try refreshing your browser. And if that doesn't work, try logging off and logging back in. Please feel free to submit questions to the presenters by typing them into the questions pane on your control panel. You may send your questions in at any time during the presentation, and we will address them during the Q&A portion at the end of this session. If we do not answer your question during the Q&A portion, we will reach out to you via email following today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording and a follow-up email along with the session survey. The session survey will also appear once the webinar ends. We value your feedback and we would greatly appreciate it if you let us know how we're doing and let us know if there's anything that we can do to further assist you. A certificate of attendance will also be included via email after this session. This session has been approved for one hour of registered sanitarian and sanitarian in training credit. If you did not submit your RS or SIT certification number in the CEU ID number box when registering, please make sure you provide us with your number through the Q&A feature. Attendees seeking American Planning Association credit may do so through APA self-reporting option log into your My APA account and select the self-reported credits option to receive credit. And if you're seeking other CEUs, please let us know if you need a certificate that includes the session timeframe. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ohio EPA's Carl Mussenden. Thanks, Dan. Again, my name is Carl Mussenden. I'm with the Ohio EPA Division Materials and Waste Management. And take you through some uh, open dumping of solid waste and scrap tires. So just a quick overview. Um, really, we're going to be talking about open dumping and the uh, difference between open dumping and littering uh, and the different um, options how Ohio EPA can help. There is the Ohio Revised Code, which is the law. And promulgated under that are the regulations uh, under the Ohio Administrative Code. And those are the rules based on the authority based in that law. Specifically, open dumping is defined in High Revised Code 3734. And basically, it's just the depositing of solid waste into a body of stream of water onto the surface of the ground that at a site that's not licensed as a solid waste facility. More so through the administrative code um, site duplication, but more specific, again, the, the definition of open dumping is defined. Also here in the deposition of solid waste, excluding scrap tires any place beside the solid waste facility. Um, for scrap tires, specific deposition on the waters of the state, on the ground anywhere besides an approved facility or in buildings, trailers, or vehicles. The prohibition for open dumping is found also in the in the, in the statute. Very clearly, that no, no person shall dispose of solid waste by open dumping or open burning, except as authorized by the director. Uh, there's also an exception there regarding burying or burning the body of dead animals authorized under section 941. Again, because we're good at duplicating in the in the regulations, 
Um, we also have a prohibition identified open dumping. Again, no person shall conduct, permit, or allow open dumping. And that that person who's done so shall promptly remove and dispose or otherwise manage the solid waste pursuant to the Ohio Revised Code. Now, the statute also is clear about who can uh, enforce the open dumping regulations. And here in 3734.07, an approved board of health or the director um, may enter any private or public property to inspect, investigate, or obtain samples. And one thing I want to point out here. It's clear that the statute says may enter. That's just, um, it's it allows sanitarians to go in and conduct an inspection. But I would just, as a word of caution, as many of you veterans out there know that if an individual uh, identifies themselves and says, no, do not enter my property, that would then domino into a um, potential warrant situation. So I would just say as a function of caution, uh, identify yourself, and if you're not allowed, or they're preventing you or hindering you from entering the property, um, that does is also identified in the statute. Um, so I just want to call that out. Unofficially, we have three, we'll call it three different open dumping types. Your individual or community dumping, um, might be an absentee landowner, trash for cash, um, where you have individuals out there just take simply taking cash, undercutting the different haulers are out there, or more commercial or industrial dump sites. Let me take you through these three. So the individual or community open dumping. These are more of what you, um, many of us who've conducted inspections in the past, where you see somebody in their back 10 acres just taking trash and throwing it over the hillside. It's, it's um, unfortunately, it's, it, it happens. It continues to happen. And this is where they're, we're talking about this, the individuals simply just taking trash and throwing it over the hillside. And just little pictures here and there. Trash for cash. We have individuals just simply taking trash, hauling it back to their 20 acres and dropping it back there, piling it up. A lot of them will even say, oh, we're recycling. Oh, we're going to do this. Oh, we're going to do that. No, it's open dumping. Again, more of a systematic unapproved, unpermitted landfilling activity. You know, we'll have individuals say, oh, I can recycle that board. I can recycle that metal. But you can clearly, there is no, there's no organization. There's no recycling. They're just piling it on and piling it on and creating more of a mess. Very common open dumping. And more for the lar a, a larger scale and a little bit different scale, more on the commercial or industrial dump sites. Here's a site up in, um, I believe it's in Ashtabula. It's an old um, um, industrial site where they were piling, I believe it was ash and some other sludges through their, through their industrial process. And their selection not disposing it properly and just piling it on their acreage. You might find some empty barrels, a lot of mingled material. It might be waste, might be, could be hazardous waste. Don't know, but you just have this piling on in their own acreage. Clearly this material has been there a while with vegetation growing through it. Broken glass, empty barrels, more commingled waste. Some sludge material uh, eroding into 
some holding pond in that area. So is it open dumping or is it some exempt? There is an I there is a provision in the in statute um, that, that this statute does not apply to single family residential premises or the storage of a hundred or fewer tires unless there's a nuisance or a hazard to the public health. Let me expand upon that a little bit. With respect to this um, single family residence, um, the single family residence produces their own garbage. In some instances, if they generate it and bury it on site, it may not be open dumping. However, local or township ordinances may apply, or maybe there's a nuisance law that's been broken here. But the, the statute allows for this exemption. We have um, one of um old coworker who was actually conducting inspection. And this is kind of your unclean living. Um, just looking at this photograph, I don't know if we have, we'd call this open dumping per se. He was there to inspect for a tire dump that was located on another part of the property. But as you can see here, miscellaneous novelty items around this individual's property. Probably not something just based on this photograph where we would necessarily cite open dumping. Again, more photographs, unclean living, certainly not how um, most people keep their property, but not identified. This is not something necessarily considered open dumping. Now we get into collectors and junk dealers, and this is where I would cue up the Sanford and Son song, but really you have individuals who are just collecting their stuff and putting it around their property, organized or not. Could it be open dumping? Could it be littering? Maybe, maybe not. Um, again, you're going to be looking at perhaps, uh, and, and those of you, uh, the health department, sanitarians, that's where you're going to be looking at perhaps the nuisance law, um, if it's applicable. But open dumping, maybe, maybe not. This individual, he was collecting more prized possessions and apparently he was living in this vehicle. Um, again, he had other miscellaneous items on his property, but just again, being a snapshot, this is not necessarily open dumping here. Litter. Now the litter law, as you'll hear in just a few, this this is the litter laws are not something that we as a highway PA enforce. This is generally uh, handled at the local level, um, and we're talking about smaller uh, waste amounts along roadways and streams as such. So the difference between open dumping and littering. Very simply put. A few bags along bags of trash along the roadside might be more of a littering issue versus open dumping like I showed earlier. We're talking something substantial, truckloads, um, dumpster full. We're talking cubic yardage amounts. More litter here. Now I'm going to touch on the revised code 3767, that's the nuisance law. Ohio EPA does not uh, administer this statute. Uh, health districts can, but we're gonna, I'm gonna bring this up today just so you know what other tools are out there. And specifically the nuisance law um, calls out that no person shall deposit litter or cause litter to be deposited. Um, I just want to identify that as another tool for the tool belt. 
who can enforce it? Um, local police, wildlife officers, natural resources, forest fire investigators, the county nuisance inspectors are likely going to be the sanitarians and, and potentially other law enforcement officers. Another statute out there, uh, littering from a motor vehicle, is uh, Revised Code 451182. No operator of a motor vehicle shall, regardless of intent, throw, drop, discard, or dis deposit litter. I get another tool for the tool belt. And the securing loads on vehicles. Another part of the statute, 451331. Again, these are items that a highway pay does not administer, but again, more tools for the tool belt. Um, who can enforce it? Again, any law enforcement officer authorized to enforce the traffic laws. Another element, littering from a watercraft. Ohio Revised Code Section 1547.49. No operator or occupant of a vessel shall, regardless of intent, litter so not just from not to and onto the ground but it from a watercraft who can enforce very similar to previous entities your sheriffs deputy sheriffs marshaled police wildlife officers that's likely who you're going to see more often the wildlife officers natural resource officers Prohibiting pollution, polluting state land or water. Again, this is going to be more your litter, but this is a another part of a statute, ORC 153129. Again, don't want to belabor it, but just so you understand that there are other, other statutes out there. And in, in, in my review prior to the uh, creation of this presentation, these statutes I was even unaware of, and I've been involved in administering the program for over 25 years. So this is some of this is even new to me. Again, those who can administer and enforce 1531, wildlife officers, sheriffs, constables, police, and so on. How can Ohio EPA help? Um, <laughs> Excuse me. For open dumping of solid waste, excluding trap tires, um, we are limited to enforcing the Ohio's open dumping laws. And um, the property owner is responsible for that waste removal. That's a strict liability statute. For scrap tires and no fault removals, enforcement, enforcement removal, and grants, um, it depends on each situation of how that's going to be handled. And that's something that um, our scrap tire program in concert with um, um, our enforcement program, figure out uh, the best course of action there. And with litter, there are grants available. Now, I'm going to turn over to my coworker, Kevin Shoemaker. Good morning, this is Kevin Shoemaker. Thank you for joining us today. There are basically two paths for state funded tire removals. The statutory authority for both of these pathways come from the higher advice code 3734.85. They are both paid for out of the same pool of spending authority and all work is done under our state contract. This contract is referred to as the scrap tire remediation services contract. The state currently contracts with two providers. One is Liberty Tire Services, and they provide assistance throughout the entire state for these scrap tire cleanups. And then Runky Waste, who only covers our Southwest District Office area counties. This portion of the program has been identified by a couple of different names over the past 20 years. Example of uh, used to be referred to as the remediation program, the removal, tire removal program, program or the consent program. 
Uh, we commonly refer to it now as the No Fault Tire Removal Program. Uh, it provides tire removal services through state contractors, as I just mentioned, currently Liberty and Rumpke. And this is at no cost to the victims of the open dumping. It does require an application that be submitted to us. It's open to private citizens, businesses, and local governments for removal of scrap tires from either private or public property. There are stipulations as far as restrictions. There has to be a minimum of 100 tires in order for this program to kick in, so to speak. There can be no more than 5,000 tires. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more in upcoming slides. But when you, when an applicant applies for this program, all the criteria of Ohio Revised Code 3734.85, it's in paragraph E, all those criteria have to be met. So we hit on the no less than 100 and the no more than 5,000. Many of you may have heard tires reported in terms of passenger tire equivalents. The conversion factor is using is used rather for converting between the number of scrap tires. Uh, it's based on the weight. Uh, so we're going to have a slide here coming up to kind of distinguish the passenger tire equivalent amounts. Many local governments aggregate tires dumped on public properties into one location in order to meet the minimum requirement of 100 tires. And that is acceptable. So this chart shows the typical passenger tire equivalent of some different size tires. Essentially, the basis of the passenger tire equivalent uh, amount is 20 pounds per passenger tire. So as you see, the largest at least on this slide that we have is 625 passenger tire equivalents. And this is large mining tires. These tires uh, stand around 14 feet high and they can weigh as much as 12,000 pounds or more. Again, we can only use scrap tire funds provided or authorized by the statute on sites where there are more than 100 tires. So again, that's specific to the actual number of tires and not passenger tire equivalents. So while the larger tires may be equivalent in weight to well over 100 passenger tires, we still would not be looking to utilize the state funds for removal of, of say, just a couple tractor tires or even a, a couple mining tires. So the eligibility requirements are outlined on this slide. I wanted to provide emphasis for the first one, so that you as an applicant can only qualify if the tires were placed on your property after you owned the property. Or it can, you can qualify if you inherited property and the tires were already there when you inherited the property. Uh, jumping down to five and six for the highlight here, uh, we want to make sure that folks don't transfer their, their title for the property just to evade liability and qualify for a program. So that's a stipulation that would uh, prove you to be ineligible. The responsible party who placed the tires on the property can't act as an agent of the property owner. So. Essentially, um, that's why we call it the no fault program. The tires are there through no fault of your own. So how do you apply? You submit, you can submit a paper application or you can apply online. There are two different application types. There's one geared for citizens and businesses. There's one geared for local governments. Um, we're going to show you some slides coming up here, uh, some screenshots of our online process to submit an application. But at any rate, all applications require a copy of the deed be sent to us, a site map to give us a general idea where the tires are located, photos of the tires, and of course, the signature of the property owner or the authorized representative. By providing that signature, 
essentially you're giving us legal access to step on your property and perform the cleanup. And again, that's done by our contractors. So currently we have this online no fault application available. Here's a screenshot that gives you an idea of what that looks like if you were to go online to try to submit an application. It's basically an interactive tool that walks individuals through the application process. Based on the responses that the applicant gives, the form changes so that the applicant only answers questions that are applicable to their situation. And it gives automatic feedback on eligibility. For example, on this one, the applicant apparently answered the tires were already there before they bought the property. So this is giving them information right out of the gate that they do not qualify for this program. The idea is that we really want to make it as easy as pop possible for people that we serve to apply. We don't want to make it hard for them by forcing them to apply online. So some folks just aren't comfortable with that or they may not have the ability to get scans of the required supporting documents. Uh, we will work with folks uh, how, however is needed. We, since we are still working remotely uh, as an agency, as a division, uh, we have been accepting those applications online, which do require scans. There have been a couple in instances where we've had to work outside the box to, uh, to go back to the snail mail where folks can't scan the documents. Not eligible for a no-fault cleanup? Well, then removal must be conducted by the responsible party or the property owner. Unfortunately, in most cases, the responsible party is probably unknown and the responsibility is gonna to fall to the property owner to clean up the site. The, the law requires the property owner ultimately though to address the problem. And this is usually done by hiring a registered scrap tire transporter, which can be pretty costly, or if they're able to haul the tires themselves, they haul the tires 10 or less at a time because if you transport more than 10 tires at a time, that is a felony here in Ohio. There is a process, however, that's available to obtain an exemption in, in order to allow folks in these situations the ability to haul more than 10 at a time. That exemption process is sought either through the local health department or Ohio EPA, depending on what county that the applicant or that the person lives in. At any rate, if the property owner fails to do the cleanup, then they can be pulled into a situation where we are forced to take them through enforcement to compel them to clean up the site. So that moves to our next topic, enforcement remo re removals. To take an enforcement action under Ohio Revised Code, Section 37-34-85, there again has to be at least 100 tires. Now, if there are less than 100 tires, we could still take enforcement, but it would be under a different provision. It would be under the general solid waste open dumping laws. So if notices of violation have failed to result in the site being cleaned up, and we do need to take enforcement, we are required by law to make diligent effort to find the responsible party and have them clean up that accumulation of tires before we order the property owner to remove the tires, and certainly before we spend any of our state funds for the cleanup. So under the procedure laid out in the statute, Ohio EPA must first identify the responsible party and issue orders requiring them to remove the tires. The party responsible for the tire accumulation then is given 120 days to undertake that cleanup. So assuming the property owner is not the same as the responsible party, if the responsible party has not conducted the cleanup in that time frame, the director now issues an additional set of orders to the property owner, and they're granted 120 days to undertake the uh, cleanup effort. If no action is taken by either party, the responsible party or the property owner, then Ohio EPA may use the state funding to remove the tires. 
However, no cleanup can occur without some formal access agreement. If the proper if the property owner doesn't sign an access form for us, then we're forced to get access through the court system, which can be a long process. At any rate, once the cleanup is complete, we're then required to place a lien on the property by law, and uh, that lien is whatever the cost of the cleanup was. That's, that's the amount of the lien. So this is a slide just kind of compares and contrasts the two removal programs for scrap tires here in Ohio. Just provides a brief summary of mostly what we've already covered or what we will cover. So now we're going to move into some uh, real life examples of uh, remediation projects that we've done. First, we're going to cover the enforcement re re removals. Uh, we've got three listed for the enforcement re removals, and then we've got three listed here for the no fault sites. Enforcement re removals. So we'll spend a lot of time on this, but the largest scrap tire enforcement site case in state fiscal year 19 was a place called Auto Haven. Auto Heaven. Uh, we kind of called it by both names. So in, at any rate, it was a site in Lorain County. They had a confirmed West Nile virus carrying mosquitoes on site. So obviously that's a, a major concern. Uh, we ended up cleaning up that site and it was 20, over 29,000 tires removed at a cost of more than $137,000. So as often is the case, there were difficult and unfavorable site conditions faced by our contractor. But nevertheless, uh, they were able to accomplish the job. And uh, as is most generally the case, this was well received by the local community. Another example is Jim's Tires. Jim's Tires is the site of one of our scrap tire generators in Columbiana County. Um, it operates new and used tire businesses on the property. By law, he's allowed to have a thousand scrap tires stored outside, but he consistently had more stored outside on the ground. Eventually, we were forced to mobilize and we removed over 13,000 PTEs at a cost of $32,000. So here it shows the site cleaned up afterward. The LEP open dump, uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's what we're gonna go with. Um, Jacqueline LEP was initially issued director, director's final findings and orders for removal of tires from her property. This is in Williams County. At the time, we thought there was probably 1,900 scrap tires there on site. Since Ms. Lepp had a truck to move the tires and she requested to transport them herself, in addition to the orders, we gave her a temporary transporter exemption that I had mentioned earlier in the presentation. It was specifically to haul tires from the site to the recovery facility, to an authorized facility. However, instead of removing tires, she used this exemption that we gave her to start illegally transporting tires. And then she dumped more tires on her property. So when we were able to mobilize, we ended up removing almost 6,000 tires on this site from the original 1900 estimate. And it came at a cost of more than $22,000. So now we'll move into a few examples to share for the no fault removals. This is the Crown City Wildlife Area. It's an ODNR site located in Lawrence County. A lot of media attention was given for this site. Uh, this site, almost the, the effort almost had to be called off because so many hypodermic needles were found in this mess of trash mixed with tires. Um, but the site ended up um, being cleaned up. We retrieved approximately 2,000 passenger tire units, and it was these were removed at a cost of about $8,000. So 
So these slides capture some of the unique conditions faced by our contractors and at times the creative techniques required to perform the cleanup. Uh, so the, these guys are uh, excellent at what they do and uh, we, we appreciate them uh, being able to go out in all kinds of different weather conditions to perform these jobs that are much needed. Uh, so they also have to be aware of safety precautions so uh, that they don't, their workers don't get hurt. Watch out for that broken glass. So that concludes the slide for the Crown City Wildlife Area. This next slide is depicting a site in Guernsey County. Uh, we were able to retrieve over a thousand passenger tire units that were removed at a cost of about six and a half thousand dollars. So as often is the case, especially in southeastern Ohio, our contractor had to deal with steep inclines to retrieve the tires from the ravine. I don't know if you'll notice how those tires are lined up in a sort of in a row. Essentially, when they're in a ravine like that, our contractor will run cables from the top of the hill, connect the, the cable to a skid steer, run the cables through the tires, and then that's and then they take off on the road, and that's how they pull the tires up out of the ravine. It's a very interesting process to watch. So the last one that we wanted to share here is the Fudge Pence site. Uh, this is a site in Preble County. More than 5,000 PTEs were removed at a cost of nearly $20,000. Again, I said more than 5,000, but I'm going with PTEs. There were definitely less than 5,000 tires, but a number of these tires were large tires. And this site is also an example of um, a site that where a daughter inherited property from her um, from her father. It was a farm, and he had accumulated these tires over the years. She inherited the property and and had to deal with this situation. Uh, but as, as someone who, who inherited property, uh, she was able to qualify for our no fault program. So you can see some of the equipment that's used by our contractors to perform these jobs. And as you can see the picture there, the various tire sizes that were pulled out from this property. So I wanted to leave you uh, with this portion of the presentation with a map showing all of the no fault scrap tire cleanups that were conducted in fiscal year 2020. So as you can see, they are scattered out throughout the, the state, but there are a, a fair number more in our southeastern portion of the state. For fiscal year 20, our contractor crews were sent out 150 times. Some of the local government sites are serviced more than once in a, in a fiscal year, but the majority of sites represented by that 150 amount are distinct locations. In uh, fiscal year 2020, there happened to be no enforcement scrap tire cleanups conducted. So this concludes my portion of the presentation. I guess I'd like to hand it now back to Dan, our moderator. All right. Um, so thank you, Carl and Kevin. We're gonna uh, we're gonna now begin answering uh, the questions submitted during today's presentation. And as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. If we don't answer your question during the Q and A portion, we will reach out to you via email following today's webinar. So Kevin and Carl, if you're ready, we'll now begin with the the first question. Um, so feel free, either one of you, to respond. Um, and uh, also for attendees, you will see that we have their email addresses up on the screen. So you can always feel free to reach out to um, any of the presenters um, after the fact. Um, unfortunately, Kelly uh, Jeter was our um, was our first presenter today, but she had an issue that um, did not allow her to make uh, this presentation. So. Carl, thank you very much for filling in for her. So the first question is, how does Ohio EPA pay for the tire cleanups? 
Yeah, Dan, this is Kevin. There are dedicated funds provided by the statute. Uh, this is um, money that's obtained at the wholesale level of tire sales. Uh, that amount is a dollar per tire. And this program doesn't get that entire a dollar, but it, it is the funding mechanism for both of the enforcement program and the no-fault program. Uh, our program gets half of that amount, and the rest of the money uh, that I mentioned, the dollar per tire, goes to local soil and water districts. And the authorization for that fee is in Ohio Revised Code 3734.901. All right, so here's a here's another question. Um, some of the tire cleanups you showed had a lot of other waste. Did you end up removing that as well? So uh, the statutory authority is specific to tires for these cleanups. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is a common thing that we run across. Where there's a lot of other solid waste with the tires. Occasionally, we can get a small amount of those of that waste if it's commingled with the tires. Uh, but as a general rule, uh, we unfortunately have to leave the the solid waste behind. So I guess as a follow up to that question, then I think that begs then who does end up cleaning up the remainder of that waste? Again, then this falls to the responsibility of the landowner uh, as a situation that, that they have to deal with, and uh, they will be um, pressed, for lack, lack of a better word, by either the local health department or Ohio EPA to address the matter. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I think for uh, the local leaders that are on today's um, webinar, that this, this probably happens quite a bit. Um, so I, that's why I wanted to make that distinction. All right, so this next question I saw, this came in a few different ways. So um, I'll ask it a couple different ways. Um, so what if I purchased a property and I didn't know the tires were on there until after I bought it? Yeah, we get that question a lot, Dan. Um, I, I would guess at least two or three times a month I'm, I'm getting calls or emails with folks ask, asking that very question. Uh, the way the statute is set up, uh, those situations would not qualify for a no fault program. So um, basically it's a buyer beware kind of situation. Uh, if, you're, if you're you as a prospective landowner are out looking for property, it really behooves you to walk the property and know what you're buying because uh, you will assume responsibility for those matters. Okay, so it sounds like it's definitely buyer beware, do your own due diligence, um, but ultimately the landowner, once you purchase that, you then assume the liability for cleanup. That is correct. Okay, and I'm guessing in those situations that the the new owner can uh, take their own independent legal action to go after the prior owner. Um, is that would that be your assumption as well, or what you've seen? I think you're right, Dan. Uh, that's something that that we, as an agency or the local health department, uh, probably would not be involved with. It would be uh, a personal matter uh, for for the new landowner and the um, the person who had who had left the tires there, but yes, I think that that is the case, and that, that could happen. Dan, I'm going to add to that. Um, if there, there's lots of different combinations and different situations that occur out there, and if there's if if someone is not clear, uh, and, and and I'm re referring more to our regulators out there, just give us a call, and because we've probably seen it and we can at least give some insight as to how the agency has handled it in the past. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, switching gears, uh, here's another question. How many times can a local government use the no fault program? 
That's a good question. Yeah, that's an excellent question. There is no limit to the number of times. Uh, again, um, I didn't mention this during the presentation, but one thing that's important, especially uh, for the, the local governments, once they submit an application, that application is good for two years. So, for example, um, a township submits an application because they have 500 tires that they picked up along their right-of-ways and they're accumulating, accumulating those tires in a township garage, perhaps. Uh, so they submit this application and uh, we go through the process and, and those tires are taken away. Uh, since they have their application on file, uh, because those tires went away, in all likelihood, there's going to be more tires coming. So uh, when they get an accumulation of at least 100 again, uh, then they can just call me or send me an email and we can plug them right back into the system and set it right up again for our contractor to go out and remove those additional tires. Now we still have the stipulation of a minimum of 100 tires and we do work under the premise that if a township and if they're able to judge in any manner that um, they may have more tires accumulated, they have 100 tires today for example, but they may have more tires accumulated two months from now and they can handle storing those properly during that two month time. We would prefer that they not contact us until two months from now uh, so that we can uh, lessen those number of trips. Does that make sense? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so but I have I have a follow up to that. This just came in. I, it's a follow up for the um, no fault. What if the owner is deceased or an LLC no longer exists? Yeah, there, there has to be someone who is owner of the property or representing the uh, local government, for example, to provide a signature. We, we have to have a signature by the property owner or someone representing the property owner. Okay. We're getting lots of good questions coming in, so keep them coming. Um, we still have another 11 minutes um, before we need to wrap up. Um, okay, so this is uh, kind of going back to the prior um, question of, of liability, but what's the responsibility of an owner of a property where open dumping or scrap tires have been deposited without the consent or knowledge of the landowner? Is it, is it basically the same response or same answer that you had before that that is, the res that is the responsibility of the landowner, um, and then they would have to take their own legal action. Carl, I'll let you chime I'll in say, on that one if you don't mind. I'll say yes. You know, the, there is the um, strict liability statute that the owner is required, but if it's if if we know who did it, then we would pursue them. That's the short answer. Okay. Um, all right. So here's a good one. I this one just came in as well. Um, has there been any consideration of enacting legislation that would require a core charge when a customer purchases new tires in order to re to remove the incentive for the customer to decline the disposal charge and take the used tire with them? This would be similar to a core charge when purchasing a new battery. Yeah, I don't, I can't speak to um, any effort on that currently, Dan. I know that that's definitely been a discussion that we've had internally, um, but I'm not aware uh, of any er current effort for that or past effort. But honestly, I've only been in the scrap tire program just over a year. So I guess I would ask Carl if he's aware of anything on that. I have I, I am not aware of that um, potential rule language. Okay. Um, so I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to answer this one real quick, um, so I don't put you guys in a position of answering an air related 
the question, but uh, the question is, can you talk a little bit about burning tires and the legal repercussions for doing this? So in the state of Ohio, we have um, open burning regulations. Uh, not all states have these, Ohio does. And, and basically in Ohio, uh, anything that doesn't have a stack or a vent uh, or a chimney is considered open burning. Um, you are not uh, permitted to burn any solid waste, including tires in the state of Ohio. Um, now there are some provisions that you can get to, um, you know, we're not talking about having a little, um, what we call a pleasure fire, like a, a campfire, a three by five campfire, um, but still in that campfire, you're to use seasoned firewood, um, you're not to burn during certain times when, uh, like the fire department, you know, dictates that, hey, this is a bad season to be burning this type of stuff. Um, but no way, shape or form are you ever uh, permitted or allowed to burn tires uh, in the state of Ohio. Uh, so to find more information on that, go to um, you can go to our Web page and, and search uh, for, a, for a specific document, but probably the easiest thing to do is go to Google or to Bing or some type of search engine and type in, know it before you light it, Ohio EPA. That's probably the, the best way to get to that document. Um, it's a trifold tri brochure and it, it walks you through all of the different types of burning, like agricultural waste, land clearing, those sorts of things. But it is very clear um, there, is, there, will be, there is no permission or permit uh, for burning of solid waste, and especially tires in the state of Ohio. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, okay, back to uh, questions specific to, um, to your program. Um, does landscape waste fall under the open dumping statute, at least if a business is involved? Landscape waste, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm going to say it depends. Um, it could be yard waste. If it's strictly yard waste, really, it's almost on a site by site, case by case basis. Um, but there is a prohibition of yard waste in the um, to to landfills, and we promote the use of uh, composting facilities for your ways. Yeah, and I can speak to this from my own experience working in the private industry. I worked for a landscaping company for a number of years and we, you know, when we would, um, we would collect our grass trimmings, you know, any type of pruning or anything, we would bring all of that uh, yard waste, if you will, um, back with us and we would dump it on the back of the property. <laughs> I'm not going to say which company this is, um, but I'm curious, would that, I, I think that kind of falls in line with this question. Is that something that's allowed? I'm thinking, Dan. Uh, I, I stumped, guess it's, it's a I stumped the presenters. <laughs> It depends on the it depends on the circumstances and how it's placed. I mean, because a lot of times that material and that situation might be shredded and used as mulch, and we don't regulate mulching op operations. Um, it could it could be open dumping, but it might be more of a nuisance situation, which we okay. don't regulate. So it, again, perhaps my answer is vague, but. Uh, it just depends on the circumstance, how much material we're talking about. Is there an impact? Is it in waters of the state? It just depends. Um, the big piles of brush, if we just call it brush, um, might not be something we're going to focus on and pursue. It just depends. Yeah, yard waste and wood waste are solid waste, but in the priority of things, we don't see much enforcement effort for that. Okay. All right. Um, so this question literally just popped in. Um, can multiple landowners consolidate open dump tires 
to a central location in order to meet the 100 tire no fault minimum? Uh, that that answer would be no. Um, if that while we allow uh, local governments to do that, they are retrieving those from property that they own or uh, are responsible for, like public right of ways. Uh, so they're gathering those from various areas that they have responsibility for, parks and such. Uh, when it comes to private landowners, that same type of uh, concept just can't apply and because the statute doesn't envision us dealing with those type of scenarios. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. Um, we are uh, at the end of our time. Um, so thank you, Carl, for filling in for Kelly. I really appreciate you doing that. Thank you, Kevin, uh, for your excellent presentation as well. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey and we value your feedback and we greatly appreciate it if you let us know how we're doing and let us know if there's anything we can do to further assist you. A certificate of attendance will also be included via email after this session. For any of the questions that we did not get to, I see that there's still a number of questions in there uh, and email address is associated with each question. So what we will do is we will uh, gather up all of those questions that were, have not been answered and we will um, send those to the presenters where they will be writing back to you in the next day or so with an answer. So before we leave for the day, I wanted you to bring you um, to bring your attention to our recycling and litter prevention grant program. Uh, if your community is planning to host a tire amnesty event, start a start or expand a recycling program, or organize a litter cleanup event, Ohio EPA has funds available. Ohio EPA's Recycling and Litter Prevention Grant Program is hosting an informational webinar on November 5th and again on January 7th to highlight the application process and those activities that are targeted by this grant program. For more information, please visit recycleohio.gov. You'll also see that information on this slide. Lastly, check out other upcoming sessions on November 4th. Uh, join us for a joint presentation with the Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation's OSHA on-site consultation program. In this webinar, we'll highlight Ohio EPA's and Ohio BWC's free and confidential assistance programs that help businesses and others address environmental and safety related issues. And need I say again, free and confidential assistance uh, for, uh, for businesses and others. As mentioned in the prior slide, on November 5th, we'll host an informational webinar on, on our Recycling Litter uh, Grant Program. If you're seeking recognition for your sustainability-related activities, join us on November 12th and December 9th to learn about our Encouraging Environmental Excellence Program uh, for businesses, communities, academia, and other organizations. And with that, we will end today's webinar. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.